Hey. As, as they all start, put yourselves back in a world where England and France are locked in a bitter conflict, where self-same bitter conflict requires an enormous expenditure of money, and where the British financial system is literally on the brink of collapse as they are running out of coins, running out of silver, and running out of faith and trust in the government because of the lack of money. So if there's something strange in the neighborhood, who are you going to call? <laughs> this, this man with his incredible hair had recently recovered from 18 months of self-induced insanity, likely from an ill-conceived alchemical experiment, and he really needed a change of scene. And it so happened that there was a big problem in the country, and they called in all the big brains to think about how to solve the economic problems. And Newton came in, said a couple things, more words were said, and eventually he became warden of the mint. And as I said, he needed a change of scene. He gladly left Cambridge for London. And the first thing he did was to apply his prodigious cogitation skills, sort of like science, to figuring out what the problem was. And the first thing he found when he did a survey of the currency was that, oddly, one in every 10 coins in England at this point in time was counterfeit. That's bad. More problematic was the fact that even the legitimate coins were about 45% debased in value. Now what that means you can see in that image. So coin clipping is one of the oldest crimes against coins, and these are Roman coins. And so the way that coin clipping and debasement work is you start with a hand-hammered coin, which is that large coin you see up there. And you can see that it's kind of rough at the edges, irregular. That's what happens when you take a hammer and two stamps and put some metal between them and hammer it. It's not very precise, which means that an industrious thief can come along with a pair of scissors and cut around the edges, and you see that in the second and third coins. And you get quite a bit of silver by doing this. You can do whatever you want. Any nefarious acts on that silver are fine, because that coin itself is still considered legal tender in most jurisdictions, which is a problem because when the government calls the coins back, in for taxes with the intent to remint them, they're actually getting at this point in time in say 1690 about 50% of the silver they put out. Which means you've got a huge drain on your silver again and it's really true that there were almost no good silver coins in circulation at this point. And so Newton looks at all of this and he says we have to recall all these coins. We have to make every new coin mechanical with safeguards against counterfeiting and clipping and he's a big champion of what's going to be called the Great Recoinage, which is one of the largest upheavals in the financial world, as far as we know, which was to take every coin in the realm, bring it back through the mint, and send it out again as a freshly minted mechanical coin. And the problem was this was supposedly impossible. It would take about 10 years to do, and it wouldn't happen before the war needed funds. And so Newton set to work again with science to... <laughs> to speed this process up. And he spent a lot of time optimizing the screw press, which is what you see over here. So those large structures at the end are what would be pulled on by big teams of men. And they would go like this, and the press would rotate, and it would stamp right in the middle, where that hapless fool is quickly tossing coin blanks in and out, in and out, trying not to lose fingers. And the problem was this would wear out work crews so quickly that the production of the mint was actually being hindered by it. And Newton did the first time and motion study in the workplace and concluded that the optimum way to use this press was about the human heartbeat, so 50 to 55 presses per minute. And it turned out that that actually increased the production of the mint along with some other tricks by a factor of about five. And he was able to complete the great recoinage in two and a half years. And there you have an example of what these stamped coins would look like. Now, the important thing about the Great Recoinage especially was that it would stop clipping because by mechanically producing the coins, you could put the ridges on the edge of them. And that's what you see here. The secret weapon of the mint was the ridging machine. And what that meant was you can't clip the coin without it being immediately apparent that it's been clipped. And that's why, symbolically, we still have those ridges on the edges of quarters today. It's from this period in time. But he wasn't able to rest on his laurels because despite having saved the currency and arguably the country, he had a second duty as Warden of the Mint, which was to prosecute coins or crimes against coins, which meant that he had to go out and attack the counterfeiters and bring them to justice, which is how he encountered the man who would arguably vex him more than Leibniz, more than Hook, more than anybody else, one William Chaloner. Now, we know very little about William Chaloner's early life, but what we do know is that when he reached London at around the age of 20, his biographer reports that 
This is how he applied himself. He used his prodigious mechanical knowledge and skills with metalwork to produce tin watches with dildos in them. That's what it says. Now, you can, you can respect the words of the Honorable Sir Noel Malcolm, MA, PhD, etc., who tells you that these were probably not sex toys. They were probably decorative curly cues. And as he says, and what could you do with a one to two inch toy? Well, please, speak for yourself. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. More to the point, if you actually look it up, the word dildo meant then what it does now, regardless of secondary definitions. And as far as I can tell, Chelona was basically making a pocket watch like this that when you open it tells you the time and surprise! <laughs> the problem is we'll never know because the secret died with William Chelona. Now, he didn't want to spend his life as a dildo salesman. He had big plans. And so he quickly moved on from this, because he really didn't make a lot of money doing this, to become the greatest counterfeiter in the land. He studied with the guilders. He learned how to apply layers of gold and silver to base metal coins. Oh, you might have to see that again. He studied with the goldsmiths and learned how to stamp, cast, and forge silver and gold coins. He bought coining equipment and he created what would become the most successful counterfeiting operation in England. And within months, he'd made hundreds of thousands of dollars by modern standards, ditched his wife and child, taken up with a mistress, bought a house in Knightsbridge, London, and bought a decorative set of silver a cutlery and plates, which he probably melted down. But the point is he was doing quite well. But lest you feel too much sympathy and sort of a affection for this scurrilous rogue, Let's just take a look at how horrible he was after this movie apparently plays again. So, it's all cute and fun until somebody gets hurt. And so let's just take one of his more commonplace crimes. So, first, Chelona would come up with a plan, and he would say, okay, in this case, he's going to have two plans, because 1695 was when the Bank of England first started producing paper currency, and there's a lot of opportunity for counterfeiting there. So he started making 100-pound notes. He also started making counterfeit checks that would pay to him from the city orphan fund. Oh. Yeah, great guy. Now, he assembled a motley crew to assist in this crime. They worked for a long time. They made hundreds of thousands of dollars again. And he profited quite well. But then, as inevitably happens, they got arrested because somebody found the counterfeit 100-pound notes. Now, this is a classic Chelonerism to pull what's called the king's evidence. And what he does is he says, hey, constable, don't worry about this. This is small fry. Did you have any idea that some horrible person is stealing from the city orphans? I know, right? I'll tell you who that person is. It's some guy named Chandler and then this other dude. Now, the other dude happens to be one of his associates. And Chandler happens to be one of his own aliases. He was a smooth operator. And this is just what happens in a Chaloner crime. Somebody's going to get hung, and it's not going to be him. And this happens over and over again. Now... He still had bigger plans than this. This is all just small fry. Counterfeiting is too risky. He had his eye on the golden goose. He wanted into the mint itself. And so it was that in the 1690s, he wrote a series of pamphlets as part of the long con. The first was about tax policy to get him recognized as a financial thinker. The second was about how to stop counterfeiting. Now, he got political support for this in a faction that wanted in in the mint. And they actually got him an audience with the Privy Council, where Chaloner, notorious forger, tells the Privy Council, it takes one to know one. I can fix counterfeiting because I know all about it. Now, the Privy Council, as you would expect, says, wait a minute. If you know all of this about counterfeiting, could it be? Could you be a counterfeiter? The problem is no jail can hold William Chaloner for long. And very quickly, he writes a letter to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he says, this is entrapment, but more to the point, there's a humongous corruption scandal inside the Mint, and I'm the only one who can fix it. Now, as we said before, the Mint was the source of credibility for the government. You've had to trust the currency. And so what did they do? They had to take him back in front of the Privy Council, where, again, he tells them, guys, people are stealing the stamps that make the coins from inside the Mint. And... I know how this is going on. And the Privy Council says, this is really bad. This is really serious. Who are we going to call to solve this problem? Indeed, Isaac Newton takes on his detective role. And apparently, he took this like a duck to water. And what happened was he took 120 depositions, arrested 30 people, and put a huge dent in the counterfeiting business in the city, but could not crack this particular crime. Everybody he asked had a different variant on the story of who stole the stamps for the coins. And it turned out that Chaloner's name came up over and over again. But Chaloner was too savvy. He wouldn't give anything up. And Newton basically said, we can't convict him. I'm willing to walk away. 
Jaloner wasn't. Jaloner came back to the table. He's like, guys, don't arrest me this time. I promise I can solve counterfeiting. The problem is the mint is full of bumbling idiots who don't know a counterfeit coin if it bit them on the ass. I can build machines that will fix all of this. It'll be great. You just have to hire me. And the Privy Council says, you know, these are very good arguments. And they say, Newton, let this guy into the mint. Let's see what you can do. And Newton's response was much looter than this actually implies. And not in my house. And they argue back and forth. Nothing happens. Newton has the authority not to let him in. Chaloner keeps arguing. Pisses Newton off. Newton redoubles his efforts. Now, we know that Newton was really into the whole detective thing. And he is reputed to have gone into various pubs like the Dogie, dressed up in disguise. He paid informers. He bribed people. He listened to gossip. He had informants within the prison itself who would listen to boasting prisoners and then use that as testimony against them. He had one of the most advanced criminal informant networks. And he put this to work against William Chaloner. And what did he find? That during this time, while Chaloner was petitioning to solve counterfeiting, he was running a counterfeiting ring outside the city jurisdiction simultaneously. And it wasn't long before Newton caught up with him in jail again. But remember, jails have a hard time with William Chaloner. And Chaloner knew that the case rested on one guy, one of his close associates, who was still alive and not hung. And he actually bribed this guy through the walls of Newgate Prison and told him to go to Scotland, which he did, which meant the case against William Chaloner collapsed, and Newton had to release him, which meant he goes back to the Privy Council, and he says, guys, Newton is using his privileged position to execute judicial murder against me because he doesn't like me. And the Privy Council says, Newton, these are very serious allegations. You're going to have to defend yourself. <laughs> and he does. He does. But from then on, he has one goal in life, which is to take out William Chaloner. Now, he assembles the entire life history of William Chaloner as much as he can. He interviews everybody, the wives of the men that Chaloner had executed. He hunts down the guy in Scotland. He figures out the sequence of events that led Chaloner to who he is at this point in time. He just can't catch the man himself because Chaloner is busy at work hiding underground making fake lottery tickets now, which is a big business actually. But he slips up and he deals with essentially like a triple agent who Newton finds out about and comes descending upon Chaloner like a vengeful angel. And now he's in prison again. And this time he manages to bribe 14 members of the grand jury and Newton simply delays the trial date. So then he sends a number of letters to Newton saying, you know, if I die, you will have murdered me. And Newton doesn't reply because apparently that's fine with him. And then he goes insane. But Newton's been there, done that, knows what's going on, it's fake, ignores it. And eventually he's got no more tricks left. And He's brought to execution in 1699, and he's, well, he's, he's tried. That was a spoiler. He's tried. His entire life history is trotted out, and within three minutes, they decide that he's guilty and should be hung, and he's given the worst kind of hanging. He's not allowed to get drunk beforehand. And so he comes to be murdered, and so Newton walks away victorious. Now, several days after Chaloner's murder, his biography is published, and we're told that his epigraph would have been, if he had a grave, that he was a man who, had he squared his talents by the rules of justice and integrity, might have been useful to the commonwealth. But as a fellow, as he only followed the dictates of vice, he was cut off like a rotten member. That's not how you want to be described. And so if we, if we take all of these things together and we try to figure out something to toast to, we can toast to the ingenuity of Newton. We can toast to the creativity of Chaloner. But let's toast to treating our friends better than he did and avoiding sudden and inevitable betrayals. Cheers. Cheers.